What's up? Medite here, and in this video, we're gonna go through the anatomy of the pharynx. So in the last video, we went through the anatomy of the oral cavity. Now the next step after the oral cavity is the pharynx, as you see here. So in this video, we're first going to look at the parts of the pharynx. So we're gonna go detailed into the anatomical structures associated with the nasopharynx, the uropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. After that, we will cut the pharynx and look at the layers of the pharyngeal wall. And then we're going to go through the muscles that act on the pharynx. Now, let's start by holding the pharynx and pull it out. You will see that it kind of looks like this, as far as my anatomy program goes, at least. Now, the pharynx is about 12 to 15 centimeters long, and it consists of three parts, as you see here. If you look at it anteriorly, you will see what the three parts are connected to. The upper one is connected to the nasal cavity, we call the nasopharynx, or pars nasalis in Latin. The middle part is associated with the oral cavity, so we call this one the uropharynx. The lower part is associated with the larynx, so we call it the laryngopharynx. Now let's change the scheme to a lateral view of the pharynx to get a better overview. We still have the nasopharynx, the uropharynx, and the laryngopharynx here. Now, in terms of the digestive pathway, the pharynx will continue downwards as the esophagus. You can think of the pharynx as a control point for breathing and swallowing, so the esophagus is usually closed off when you're breathing, as you see here. But when you swallow, the soft palate blocks for the nasopharynx, so the food doesn't end up in the nasal cavity. The larynx gets blocked by the epiglottis, and the tongue goes up to the palate to push the food further down the esophagus. So that should give you a little overview of the pharynx. Let's expand on that by going through all the structures associated with the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx corresponds to the level of the first to second cervical vertebrae and is attached to the base of the skull. The attachment points between the pharynx and the base of the skull are called fornix pharyngeus or translated as the vault of pharynx. The vault of pharynx is where the mucosa, which is the wet surface of the pharynx, is firmly attached to specific regions on the base of the skull. And to understand these attachment points, let's look at this model right here and look at it from this perspective and zoom in a little bit. Now we're able to see the actual attachment points of the fornix pharyngeus. Now just for orientation's sake, here is the nasal cavity and here is the oral cavity. And so this blue line is the attachment points of the pharynx. But there are some important landmarks that should be noted when, when talking about the vault of pharynx. And they are highlighted here. We have the pharyngeal tubercle of the occipital bone, which is the basal part of the occipital bone. The next attachment point is where the occipital bone and the petrous part of the temporal bone fuse. Um, the petro-occipital fissures is called. It's also attached to the inferior border of the petrous part of the temporal bone. And it attaches to the medial lamina of the pterygoid process. So the pharynx is attached to these structures and form the vault of pharynx. Alright, so the pharynx and the nasal cavity are connected. And there is a strict border between those two that you use as a landmark to separate the pharynx from the nasal cavity. And this border is called shawana, or the internal nose. So that's usually the border between the nasal cavity and the pharynx. Now, another structure you find in the nasopharynx is the auditory tube. And that's a tube that connects the pharynx to the middle ear. So let's look a little bit into that. So here you see the eustachian tube, or the auditory tube, it's a synonym. So we have the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And in the middle ear, that's where you'll find the ossicles, which are called the malleus, incus, and stapes. And this is the tympanic membrane. So the auditory tube connects the nasopharynx to the middle ear. Now why do you need the auditory tube? Well, as you listen to my voice through this video, your eardrum, or the tympanic membrane, will vibrate in a specific manner. This vibration will then be converted into an electrical signal through a whole auditory pathway based on the actual vibration of the tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane can vibrate because the pressure difference is stabilized. And you see why it's stabilized. The auditory tube is the only way the middle ear can regulate its pressure. At rest, the auditory tube is always closed, completely closed. But remember, in our last video, we looked at the swallowing process and all the muscles attached to the auditory tube. If you now try to swallow, the auditory tube opens, 
And now you will feel a slight pressure relief in your middle ear, and that's because the auditory tube opens up to relieve the pressure. When you sit in a plane and you take off or you're landing and the cabin pressure changes, you can feel that pressure change in the air, can't you? When you drive up and down mountain hills, you feel that pressure change as well. And what you're feeling is a difference in pressure between the pressure in the middle ear, in here, and the air pressure out there. The usual mechanism is that an increase in pressure in the middle ear will push the tympanic membrane outwards, and if you decrease the pressure, the tympanic membrane will be sucked in, as you see here. And what happens is that sometimes this auditory tube gets stuck flat due to the pressure change. Now, what do you do to get rid of that sensation? Well, you swallow, and you swallow, and then you feel a slight pop in the ear. That's when you notice the eustachian tube has opened again and relieved you from the pressure. So that's one function of the eustachian tube, equalizing the pressure. Another thing is that if you have a middle ear infection and a lot of pus starts to build up here, the auditory tube can drain all that pus into the pharynx to aid in clearing out that infection. But if this infection produces too many symptoms, you have to give some broad spectrum antibiotics as well to help out, like amoxicillin with clavulanic acid. So two main functions of the auditory tube are equalizing the pressure when swallowing and draining the middle ear to protect from pathogens. All right, so that is a tube auditiva. The point where the auditory tube opens into the pharynx is called ustium pharyngeum tuba auditiva, which literally translates as the opening of the auditory tube. Here you will have cartilage protruding above the opening of the auditory tube called torus tubarius, or cushion of the auditory canal, as well as a small groove behind the auditory tube called the pharyngeal rhesus. Now, we do have tonsils here as well in the nasopharynx. There's the pharyngeal tonsils up here, or also called the adenoids, which can sometimes be inflamed and enlarged and block the auditory tube. And another tonsil back here called the tubal tonsil. And it's called the tubal tonsil because it's uh, located behind the auditory tube. So that was all for the anatomy of the nasopharynx. Next is the uropharynx, which is situated at the level of the third to fourth cervical vertebrae. The uropharynx is bordered by the soft palate and the epiglottis, as you see here, and is connected to the oral cavity through something called isthmus faucium, or the uropharyngeal isthmus, which is an opening at the back of the mouth into the throat. And that was the uropharynx. Now much to talk about this one. Next, we have the laryngopharynx, which is at the level of the fifth to sixth cervical vertebrae. The laryngopharynx is, as we saw earlier, going to continue into the larynx. So whenever you swallow, the epiglottis here will close the laryngopharynx so that the food can end up in the esophagus and then down to the stomach. So these two openings are called the laryngeal inlets and the opening of the esophagus. All right, so if you look at the larynx posteriorly, we can see the nasopharynx up here, the oropharynx is here, and then we have the laryngopharynx down here. Now there's one more anatomical landmark here on the laryngopharynx called the piriform fossa. The piriform fossa is just a depression on either side of the laryngopharynx, uh, which has its own anatomical name, the piriform fossa. So that was all the parts of the larynx. Now let's go ahead and go through the layers of the pharyngeal wall. So if you look at the pharynx again and cut it right about here, then look at it from this perspective, you will see that we have four layers. The first one is a tunica mucosa, which lines the inner layer of the pharyngeal cavity. The mucosal layer is lined by epithelial tissue, and different regions are lined by different type of epithelium. So if you take a small section of the nasopharynx, you will see that it's lined by respiratory epithelium, that consists of pseudostratified epithelium with cilia, as well as goblet cells between them. While the rest of the pharynx has to endure the pressure of food coming through the mouth, so it's lined by stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelia for protection. So that is the first layer. The next layer is the tela submucosa, containing primarily connective tissue, um, as well as blood vessels and lymph vessels and glands. So that was this layer. The next layer is a muscle layer called tunica muscularis, consisting mainly of two types of muscle fibers. The inner muscle fibers are arranged circularly, and the outer one are arranged longitudinally. And here you see why we call them circular and longitudinal. You see that the internal part looks circular, 
while the outer part looks longitudinal, and that's to aid with the pharyngeal peristalsis. Peristalsis is the controlled synchronized contraction to help with the movement of the content either in or out. So that is this layer. The last layer is a tunica adventitia, which is a tough layer of collagen fibers that cover the pharynx from the outside. So that was all for the pharyngeal wall. The last thing we're going to look at in this video is the external muscles of the pharynx. We divide the muscles of the pharynx into the pharyngeal constrictors and the pharyngeal elevators, and both of them consist of three muscles each. You know, only by looking at their names, constrictors and the elevators, you can kind of already get a hinge of their function. Alright, so let's start with the constrictors first. So here we see the pharynx and the skull, and here we see all the three constrictor muscles. Um, you have the first one, which is the superior pharyngeal constrictor. If you zoom in a little bit, you will see that it originates from the spinous process and the pterygomandibular ref, and it's going to originate from the milohyoid line of the mandible, and then it's going to insert at the pharyngeal ref, as you see here. So the whole white line right here is the pharyngeal ref. So that is this muscle. The next muscle is the medial pharyngeal constrictor, highlighted right here. It's going to originate from the hyoid bone and insert at the pharyngeal ref. And the last one is the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. This one is pretty interesting because this one will originate from the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, those are the cartilage of the larynx, and then they will insert at the pharyngeal ref as well. So the constrictor muscles of the pharynx are very easy to remember because they all have the same name. There are the superior, medial, and inferior pharyngeal constrictor. They all have the same insertion point, which is the pharyngeal ref, and they all have the same function, which is constricting the pharynx as you swallow to aid the peristalsis, which is the movement of the pharyngeal wall to move the content down. All right, so now the next group of muscles is the pharyngeal elevators. And remember, the constrictors will constrict the pharynx, and the elevators will make sure to elevate the pharynx when you swallow. So the first one is the stylopharyngeus muscle. Um, this one will originate from the styloid process, and then insert at the lateral wall of the pharynx. And again, remember, since it originates from up here and inserts down here, then that means that these muscle fibers, when they contract, they're going to pull and elevate the pharynx. The next one is the palatopharyngeus muscle. So looking at its name, it's going to originate from the soft palate and then insert at the pharynx. Or to be specific, it's going to originate from the aponeurosis of the soft palate and then insert at the lateral wall of the pharynx. And finally, the last muscles of the elevators is the salpingopharyngeus muscle. It's going to originate from the walls of the auditory tube and then it's going to insert at the um, fibers of the palatopharyngeus muscle. So when you swallow, it's also going to help open up the auditory tube. So that was the anatomy of the pharynx. If you found this video helpful, please put a like, share, comment, whatever you find convenient to you. The next video is going to be about the esophagus.